Uh, good evening, Slovakia. Thank you so much for having me here. Thanks for your incredibly generous reception. Thanks, Ines. All fantastic. Let me start by giving you a gift. I'm told that underneath two of your chairs there are certificates for autographed copies of The Case Against Education. So if you look under your chair, this is like Oprah Winfrey. But it's, I'm afraid it's not a car, it's just a book. But anyway, if you look under, you may find that you are the lucky winner of an autographed book. All right. This is the first time this has ever happened in a talk. Maybe we'll adopt this idea. All right. So let me talk to you about my book, The Case Against Education. Uh, this is a topic that has been on my mind since I was five years old. It really has. Because when I started school when I was five, I was confused. Why are we studying this material? Why is this so important? Why do we all have to do this? When I would ask adults, why? They would say, well, to get a good job. I said, all right. That sounds true. The adults that I know with good jobs did well in school. But still, it's confusing. Why is it that you need to learn Spanish in America to go to a good college? Well, you don't really have to learn Spanish. You just have to study it for three years and get good grades, which in America means you don't speak any Spanish at all. All right. Anyway. So, let's see. Wait. Is this... Let's see. This does not seem to be working. Let's see. Does someone else want to, want to advance it? I'm sorry. Uh, ah, okay. Now it just went out. Uh, okay, uh, okay, great. All right, so let me just start with what is the normal view of education in the United States, and I bet that is also the normal view here. I have never spoken in a country where this was not the normal view. Maybe Slovakia is the one different place, and you'll tell me this is not what people believe here. All right, so first of all, we should have more and better education. We should have more and better education. Is this a standard view in Slovakia? Would a politician run for office and say we need less and worse education? Would that be a way to win an election? Like, probably not. Uh, it's also a case where economists and the public largely agree. In my other book, The Myth of the Rational Voter, I talked about all the big disagreements between economists and the public. The public likes protectionism, economists like free trade. Education is different. Education is a case where there is a convergence, where economists and the public think about the same thing. We need to invest more in education. When you look at economic research on education, a standard result is that the economic return to education is very high. What this means is that if you measure education the same way that you measure investing in insulation for a building to save energy costs. The rate of return that you find for education is usually above the stock market return. Right? And many economists look at these numbers and say, ah, this is the proof. Science has shown that education builds human capital. Education is a place where unskilled students go in and highly skilled adults come out. Uh, but, there's something very puzzling about this whole process, which is if you actually experience education, and I believe everyone here has experienced education for many years, right? Anyone here raised by wolves? You didn't, uh, you didn't do any school? All right. It is hard not to notice that most classes teach no job skills at all. I am confident of this for the United States where you can look at the subjects that we study. Like I said, it is very normal in the United States to say that you have to do three or four years worth of foreign language. Now, obviously here, most of you actually use a foreign language. You know how to speak English. Americans, as you may have heard, do not know other languages. Or really, the only Americans that know foreign languages well are normally immigrants. You don't learn foreign languages in American schools unless a miracle happens. And yet, it's required. Uh, the same goes for studying history, or civics, or natural science. These are all subjects where most students will never use them after the class. You only need to know them for the test. After the test, you can safely forget everything you ever learned. 
Right, so we think about what fraction of jobs in the U.S. use knowledge of history. History teacher. There you need knowledge of history. What else? Like writer of history books. That's like five people. All right, so and then that's about it. Or a higher mathematics. Fraction of Americans that would use calculus or trigonometry on the job. Very low. Even people that know much higher mathematics usually don't use anything more than algebra. Right now, um, in America, we make students do many years of music and art. Do you have to do that in Slovakia? Many years of music and art in school? Sometimes. All right, yeah, so when my sons were in fifth grade, they had three mandatory music classes. Three. They had a mandatory chorus class, a mandatory music appreciation class, and a mandatory dance class. Right, I called up the vice principal and I said, could they just go to the library instead of dancing? They don't like dancing. And the vice principal said, no, all students must dance. All must dance. All right, required. Okay. Uh, Shakespeare, you're familiar with Shakespeare. Yes. It's language, English it was spoken several hundred years ago. You don't really need it in real life. Foreign languages in the United States. Uh, Latin, do they still teach Latin in Slovakia? A little bit? All right, well. In the United States, Latin disappeared and then it came back. Latin is back. Why? All right. Uh, when I was a student, there was often one troublemaking student in the back of the room saying, Teacher, what does this have to do with real life? What does trigonometry have to do with real life? And normally the teacher would have a very condescending look. And, oh, you'll see. You'll see. What's the answer? Yes. Well, what we see is that it has nothing to do with real life. Now, what's so, though, what is so strange about this? You might look at this and say, it's normal. Government wastes money. It's what government does. They take money from taxpayers and they waste it on stupid stuff. But education is different. How is it different? Because employers care. The government makes you study a bunch of subjects that seem irrelevant, but if you fail those subjects, it makes it hard to get a good job. That's very strange. Why would employers pay a large premium because you've learned Latin? You can't work in my bank because you failed Latin. It's weird. Why? Is this a Latin bank? What difference does it make? All right. Now, as I eventually learned, uh, it is easy to explain all these facts using something economists call the signaling model of education. This is not a theory that I created myself. Uh, there's another economist, Michael Spence, who has a Nobel Prize for it. What is original about my book is that I believe the theory. There are many pure theorists who work on it, but all they do is prove math about what the world would be like if there was signaling. What I do in my book is I argue that actually this is the model that explains the strangeness of the industry of education. The main idea of the signaling model is this. Yes, some schooling raises productivity. You learn how to read. Reading is helpful on the job. That's not a puzzle. I'm not trying to explain that because we all understand that. But a lot of school is doing what we call hoop jumping, jumping through hoops. You jump through a hoop and you go, ta-da, look at me. Look at how great I am. I jump through hoops, right? Uh, to, why do you do it? To show off or to signal your, your intelligence, your work ethic, and also just your conformity, your willingness to obey, to follow rules, to comply with orders. A way we think about it is that one reason why an employer might want a well-educated worker is because the education gives you skills. But he might also hire you because you have many stamps on your forehead saying, fantastic worker, great worker, wonderful worker. See, what is Slovakian for stamp? Like a stamp on your head, a stamp on paper. What, what's the word? Pečiatka. Pečiatka. It's easier in Spanish. It's just a stampa. All right. What he said. All right. So, now the key assumptions of signal models. First of all, differences between workers must be hard to observe. You can't simply ask a worker, are you a good worker? If you answer yes, I will hire you and give you lots of money. You can't do that because almost everyone will say, yes, I'm a good worker, give me lots of money. 
Right? You can't simply look at a person and say, ah, he's good, he's bad. Right? But secondly, you need the true ability workers to correlate with the observable things, like school grades or diplomas. And then for this auto work, you need higher productivity workers to have lower costs of doing whatever this observable thing is. There could be a higher cost in, or a lower cost in money. Right now, at first, you might say, how do good students spend less money in school? At least in the United States, it's very clear, because good students finish on time. In America, a college degree takes four years, officially. Is it the same in Slovakia? Four years? Four, is it four? Five. 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 All right, five. All right. All right. UK is only three. But anyway, in, in the US, it is four, officially. But only 35% of full-time American students finish their degree in four years. Most finish in five years or six years. If you were a good student, then you could have paid tuition for only four years or maybe only three years instead of for five or six years. Time, of course, same thing. Better students finish sooner because they actually pass their classes and get done. But also pain. Right? Good students are always being told, you're a good student, good work, well done. Right? Whereas not so good students are told, needs improvement. Needs improvement. This is the American term. Are Slovakian teachers nice now or are they mean? Do they say, if a, if a student does badly, do they say, bad, stupid? Or do they say, well, everyone needs to learn how to improve. <laughs> what, what, what are some what are te like, are you now, have, are, are teachers nice now or are they still hard? You're they're mean? All right. Uh, opinions differ. All right. Key thing, in signaling models, the market reward people for showing off their abilities, even if the display by itself is wasteful. You really might get a job because you were the top student in Aristotle. It's a job in a bank. You don't use Aristotle working in a bank yet. The employer might say, oh wow, look at how look at the student and his incredible performance versus his class. In philosophy, yeah, but, yeah, that's a hard subject. Most people couldn't do it, right? So let's hire him. Right now, I want to be clear. Um, this view that I'm presenting to you is not only controversial, it is only a minority view in economics, a minority view particularly among education and labor economists, who are the economists who study the subject, which does make me nervous. Right? The people that know the most about the subject disagree with me. The most popular view is the simple view that you go to school, you acquire skills, and that's why it works. There's nothing strange to explain. So why should you agree with me a dissident instead of the majority of smart people who study the subject. Right. Well, I see the strongest reason to believe me is just to look at curricula. Look at what students actually study. And you, if you are not puzzled, I will just say you are totally lacking in curiosity. All right. So in the United States, if we take a look, we can see that only 30% of high school course hours are spent on English and math. Over 40% of high school course hours are spent on the arts, foreign languages, history, social studies, other subjects that would very rarely lead to useful job skills. We can see a very similar pattern for US college majors. I go through all of the data on different majors of graduates in the United States. Less than 25% have ones that you could even argue are vocational. You know, so engineering, computer science, Things like that, chemical engineering, these are all subjects that sound that are vocational, but that's actually a small minority. Engineers are only about 5% of American college graduates. <coughs> uh, it is true that, there are, that liberal arts have declined in the United States, so that we have fewer people who major in philosophy or history or English literature, but this is not because they're moving into science and engineering. Rather, what they're doing is they're moving into what I call the fake vocational majors. Majors like communications. All right, what is communications? Well, officially, this is where they train you to be a broadcast news personality or a radio host or a journalist. There are so few jobs in this industry that the vast majority of communications majors will never get such a job. Uh, psychology is another good example. It is almost impossible to get a job in psychology with a, with a degree in psychology. You need to have additional degrees on top of that before you could ever get it. 
Uh, another way that we can do this is look at measured learning. Usually in research, we give students tests at the end of a, at the end of a course, and we say this measures what they learned. But that is one measure of what they learned, but there is a problem. Uh, psychologists have discovered an amazing fact: people forget things. People forget things, and even more amazingly, people forget things after they stop using them. If you go and study Russian in school, and then you don't speak any Russian for 20 years, what happens to your Russian? It goes away. All right. So in the United States, there's actually a small number of tests of academic subjects that we give to adults. We find not people at the, at the end of the class year, but we find people who are in their 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s, and we say, hey, would you sit and take a test of school material and see how they do? All right. So in the United States, here's what we find. Uh, when you measure the literacy and numeracy of American adults, it is shockingly low. About a third of American adults really are barely literate or numerate. They, can, they know letters, they know numbers, but they can't do very basic things like add up a column of numbers or explain an article in a newspaper. All right. But anyway, at least you might say, well, that's better than nothing. When we turn to other subjects, when we turn to the subjects of civics, history, science, and foreign languages, there we find that American adults know next to nothing. Next to nothing. All right, so for foreign languages, what we see is that if you just ask Americans, do you speak a foreign language very well? And if so, how do you learn it? Less than 1% of Americans even claimed that they learned to speak a foreign language very well in school. And this is self-assessment. Like, how are you at speaking foreign languages? Oh, I'm great. I'm great. All right. So, so there's that. When you look at question tests of science, well, the way these tests work is that they ask the easiest questions you could possibly imagine. If the science test actually has the question, does the earth go around the sun or the sun go around the earth? There's an actual question on it. And what the test find is that the average American adult gets about half the questions right when they're the easiest possible questions. All right, now you might say, all right, well, that's something. See, no, it's really nothing. Right? Imagine if someone knew half the letters in the alphabet. What do you call someone who knows half the letters in the alphabet? Half literate? No, you are illiterate if you only know half the letters in the alphabet because you just can't read anything. Similarly, if you do not understand that senators in the United States serve for six years and representatives serve for two, you really don't have any idea what's going on in Washington, D.C. All right, so first of all, we look at the curriculum and see how otherworldly it is. It looks like it comes from another planet. Now, second thing we see, so this ubiquity of useless education would not be puzzling if employers said, that's stupid, I don't care. If employers looked at your Latin grades and said, so what? Then we would just say, ah, oh, it's the usual case, government wastes resources. No big surprise. Uh, but what we can see is in the U.S. the market rewards education very well. Now, to be fair, the U.S. seems to be almost the highest rewarding of education country in the world. Uh, the English-speaking world in general has the highest payoffs for education, so U.S., U.K., Canada are countries that seem to have close to the very highest payoffs. But even in other countries, it's somewhat lower, but still, every country ever studied, there is a clear payoff for education. All right. Furthermore, if you know statistics, you might be tempted to say, maybe this is just a fake relationship. If we go and make proper statistical adjustments, we will discover that it is not true that education pays. Uh, at least for the United States, what you can say is you could make almost every adjustment that you can think of, almost everything you could imagine has been done, and you will still see that a large payoff for education remains after trying to statistically adjust the results. Right? What is really interesting about signaling, what is neat, is that signaling is a great way to reconcile two bodies of knowledge. We have all of our knowledge about learning that says that students learn very little in school. Then we have all of our knowledge of earning, which says that school pays off a lot. The signaling model can explain how both sets of results are true, 
You can go to school, learn very little that is useful, get good, get good grades, and then get a good job because of it. The model is totally able to explain that. All right, now let me go over further arguments to convince you that I am right and most people working in this field are wrong. Uh, these are all arguments that I think you can assess against your own experience. You know, as I often say, education is not like working on an offshore oil drill. Right? Is anyone, did anyone here ever work on an offshore oil drill? Ever? Right? If it was Norway, then maybe I could find someone. But, all right. So, now, if I was talking about working on an offshore oil drill, and I started talking, you know, like you might say, well, I've never worked on one. I don't know whether these arguments make any sense. But if I'm talking about what it's like to go to school or to have a job, I think everyone in this room has a lot of directly relevant first-hand experience. So I feel comfortable making these arguments because you do have the knowledge from your own first-hand experience to assess whether these arguments are correct. All right. Uh, first of all, you might be signaling if you bother to enroll or pay tuition. Now, college in Slovakia is free, right? Um, but I will tell you that in the United States, a college is normally not free. College is normally not free. You have to pay money. To go to my university, for example, the in-state tuition, this is the cheap tuition for people who live in my state, is about $12,000 per year. About $12,000 per year. So what is that? In, you know, I mean, that, that, that's, it's, that's like 11,000 euros. Like 11,000 euros. That's right. You're on the euro. Okay, great. I've been in a bunch of countries where I didn't know what the money was, and then it was hard. I had to open my wallet in Hungary. What is the money called here again? All right. Anyway, in Poland, that's hard to pronounce. <laughs> All right. So anyway, but in America, we're going up. We, the colleges charge tuition. And yet, normally, there is, it is not a problem to simply move to a university and start taking classes. Right. COVID messed everything up, so it's confusing. But uh, before COVID, if you, you know, suppose you thought that Princeton was the best university in America. It was very easy to move to the town of Princeton and start attending classes in Princeton unofficially. If you, as long as you look like a student, the professor will probably not even notice what's going on. If you're compulsively honest, you might go to the professor and say, oh, great professor, I'm not really a student here, but I'm really interested in medieval history. May I please learn? And if you did this, the normal reaction from the professor would be first shock, and then a little tear would go down <laughs> his face. So like, you want to learn what I am to teach? This has never happened before in all my years. That's the way that it would work. So, you could go to Princeton. You don't need to enroll. You don't need to apply. You don't need to pay any money. You can learn as much as you want at Princeton. There's just one small problem. At the end of four years, you do not have the stamp on your forehead. You have no proof that you went there. So, what is the value in the labor market of this degree going to be? Probably almost nothing. As a result, many students will pay $12,000 a year to go to a school that is considered much worse, where there will be an official record that they went there, so they get credit. All right. Another way to think about this is, imagine that you are trapped on a deserted island. All right. On a deserted island, which would you rather have? Knowledge of boat building or a degree in boat building? Right. Would you rather have the knowledge without a degree or would you rather have the degree without the knowledge? On an island, you obviously want the knowledge, what good is a degree? And yet, I often ask people, which would you rather have? A Princeton diploma without the education, or a Princeton education without the diploma? Almost everyone says, yeah, I'd rather have the diploma. But even if you, like, I said, look, it doesn't matter what your answer is, as long as you had to think about it, as long as you said, hmm, that's a hard question. That proves my point, which is that a lot of the value of the education comes from that diploma. Another sign is, you know, of what you might be signaling is this. If you worry about failing the final exam but not forgetting what you learned. If you worry about failing the final exam but not forgetting what you learned. Right? Think about some of the classes that you have taken. Right? Uh, are there any where you barely remember anything? You just barely remember anything about the class. 
Well, it seems like you are in the same position as someone who never learned it, but not to employers. For employers, there's a big difference between getting an A in the class and then forgetting it all, and just getting an F, which is that a person who got an A, you show that you are willing and able to learn. You show that you're smart, that you're hardworking, that you're conformist. Even if you've forgotten all of your Latin, still the fact that at one time you learned Latin shows something good about you, it sends a good signal, whereas that F sends a bad signal. Right? If it was all about the skills, employers would not pay you because you used to know something. I used to know how to program in Python. <laughs> Great. Unfortunately, this is a job for people who can program in Python now. Very different. Uh, another sign you might be signaling is if you do not believe that cheating is only cheating yourself. This is a very common sermon that American students get. If you cheat, you are only cheating yourself. Out of the knowledge of trigonometry, you are going to need to work in a bank. All right, this is standard. Like, do Slovakian teachers say you're only cheating yourself if you cheat? Yes. Well, uh, that is true if the reason why you're going to school is purely to acquire useful, useful knowledge. But on the other hand, if you're going for a signal, then cheating is an obvious benefit. Cheating is a way to impersonate, to pretend to be a good student. And then the world will give you the rewards of being a good student. Who do you victimize when you cheat if signaling is true? You victimize your employer who thinks that he's hiring a high-quality worker and he gets a low-quality worker. You also victimize your classmates because you are devaluing their degree. Even a cheater does not want to go to a school where everyone is known as a cheater. You want to be the one cheater at an honest school. That's what you're looking for. Another sign you might be signaling is if you seek out easy A's, and A is the highest grade you can get in an American class, what is it in Slovakia? Is it a, you know, get a five, or what do you get here? Uh, an A? Oh, it's the same thing, right? Hungary, it's a five. All right. It is standard for American students to try to find the teachers that give you an easy A. Like they give you an A in exchange for very little work. If you really wanted to learn the material, you might want a hard grader who has high standards, who challenges you. But if all you want is to have good grades, then you want someone that is easy. Or one of my favorite ones, uh, you might be signaling if... You are happy when teachers cancel class. Teacher says, here's what I'm going to do. The school will take all your regular tuition money. I will go to Slovakia and have a vacation, and you will not have to go to class. The student's reaction, you might think, would be, this is not fair. You are cheating us of the knowledge and education and the human capital we need. But I've never had this experience. Instead, the experience is always, yay, we pay you, we learn nothing, perfect. Right, that's the reaction. Actually, this week, my students are taking their midterm exams, so I'm not cheating them of their knowledge. Uh, but <laughs> uh, a few times I have cheated them of their knowledge, and there were, no, there were no complaints at all. I've even told them, look, if one student in this class feels cheated, email me, and I will arrange for a substitute teacher. I never received the email. <laughs> All right, now what is wrong with signaling? Who cares if education builds human capital or just signals it? Right, so the answer, uh, the answer is that signaling models imply that education has negative externalities. Now, if you're not an economist or you haven't heard the term negative externalities, this is the technical term that economists use for air pollution, things like that. You run a business, you make money, but you don't care that when you make money, you make the ear bad and cause lung cancer. It's a negative externality. All right. Um, in signaling models, when you get more education, you are making everyone else look bad. You get a, everyone else has a high school degree, you get a bachelor's degree. They look bad because they don't have that degree. You get a master's degree, people with a bachelor's degrees look bad. You get a PhD, people who only have a master's look bad. Right? Let's see. In Slovakia, do you have the habilitacion? It is. You have the second doctorate? Oh my god. <laughs> when I heard Germans have to do a second doctorate. <laughs> All right. So, uh, what's the idea? Well, a, a, a very good analogy is standing up at a concert. 
Imagine you're all sitting in a concert, but you want to see better. What can one person who wants to see the musician better do? Stand up. Therefore, if everyone stands up, everyone sees better. Right? No. All right. In the signaling model, education is like that. If everyone gets a bachelor's degree, it is as if no one had a bachelor's degree. Then you need to get another degree and another degree. Right? Now, this is not true yet, but there's a joke about getting a master's in janitorial science. Right, to be a janitor. All right. Okay. So in signaling models, that is the problem, is that education is a way for you to get a better job by making other people look worse than you because you have more signals than they do. All right. Now, when I, so as you, I think you did say this, say this a little bit, uh, all of my books are controversial. I never write about a, a subject that is not controversial. I do have mainstream views. I believe the sky is blue. I'm convinced. But I'm not going to write a book called The Sky is Blue. Right? Like everybody knows that. There's probably already books about the blueness of the sky. You don't need me to write that book. I write books on controversial subjects where I think if I don't write the book, no one will write the book. And yet, when I present, um, so my other books, audiences are often very, very strongly opposed immediately. They immediately start disagreeing with me. For education, I can talk to a totally normal American audience, and until this minute, everyone is saying, yes, yes, of course, of course, it's totally true, correct, correct, fits my experience, yes, yes. And then I say this part, major policy implication, drastically cut education spending, in slogan form, austerity, Austerity. You have anti-austerity protesters in Slovakia? Yes, yeah, so I know austerity is a word with a negative connotation, but I love the word, I want the word. You know, austerity just means using taxpayer money carefully. Saying, wait a second, how much money do you want? What are you going to do with it? What happened to the last money I gave you? I want to see proof that it actually works. The same attitude when I was a teenager and I asked my dad for $10. He didn't say, oh yeah, sure. So, what do you need it for? What happened to the last $10? What did it buy? What did it get? These are the questions that should always be asked by whoever is in charge of taxpayer money. Of course. I say, it doesn't matter what your ideology is, you should want the person who is in charge of taxpayer money to very carefully guard taxpayer money. So anyway, my major policy implication is to drastically cut education spending. Now, why would someone disagree? Because, ooh, look, we spent 45 minutes saying how wasteful education is, how what you're learning is not useful, how it causes credential inflation. You cannot have everyone get a good job just by giving everyone a good degree. So I say, look, obviously the implication is let's spend less. But this is where finally an audience that has been agreeing with me and saying yes, yes, says no. But how about we cut one penny of spending? No, we cannot cut one, one penny. We need every penny. Why? Why? Now, the main answer to this that when people think about it is, well, look, why don't we just spend the money better? We don't have to spend less. Let's spend it better. And my answer to this is, look, the system that we know has been wasting money for many decades, which means one of two things. Either they don't know how to spend the money well, or they don't care. One or the other. Either they are, do not know how to spend the money well, or they are irresponsible and untrustworthy wasters of taxpayer money. Either way, I say, this is a good reason to take their money away from them. Uh, furthermore, what I'll say is that it is very easy to cut spending. We know how to do it. Just take the budget number and change it to a smaller number. <laughs> and the job has been done. On the other hand, actually improving education is extremely hard. What would it take, for example, to change American foreign language education so Americans actually learn foreign languages? What would be required? I actually believe that if you put me in charge, I could do it. Like because there is good research on the right way to teach foreign languages, and the correct method is immersion. Right, that is the right way to teach German from day one. 
not allowed to speak any English. Strict immersion, right? that does actually work. But you're not going to get American teachers to do that. It requires too much effort. It requires them to say that some people are good and some are bad, that some are failing and some are learning. American teachers are very nice, but they are not logical. They're not results oriented. So to go and try to reform foreign language education in the United States is basically hopeless. So cutting is easy. Meaning for reform is very hard. My favorite compromise here is, I'll tell you what, here's my deal. We cut the spending, and then if you figure out a way to actually make Americans learn foreign languages, you can have your money back. But the, the, we cut the spending first, and you figure out how to solve the problem, then you get the money. We don't give you money so you can keep working on it. You've been working on it, so we're probably not working on it for 100 years with nothing to show for it. All right, so this is one that is very controversial. People don't like it. But I say it really does follow very readily from what I'm saying. If you agree that there's a lot of waste, the obvious answer is let's waste less. Let's cut the waste. Now, minor policy implication, uh, which is much less controversial, is to make education much more vocational. To focus more on teaching actual practical skills. So I know in the German-speaking world this is common. In Slovakia, do you have... Voca a vocational track for students, so you do. So I'll say, you know, this is a lot better than what we have in the United States. So in the United States, we have just a little bit of vocational education, it's barely anything, right? The American model is we're preparing all students for college. All students, the plan is for them to go to college. It doesn't matter if they've been failing math for their whole lives. Everyone is gonna go to college, that is our plan. Uh, now, I say that one of the biggest differences in results is that the United States has a much larger underclass of students who just drop out of high school and become criminals, especially males. Right? So young males in the United States have a very high rate of criminality, or particularly young male high school dropouts. Right? So in countries like Switzerland, young males that hate school go and learn how to be expert woodworkers. In the United States, they become criminals and go to jail. Right? And so that is a much worse outcome for society and them. I mean, honestly, just learning to work at McDonald's is much better than being in jail. Obviously. Obviously. But um, this is something where people just feel so it's un-American. You know the word un-American. It's un-American just to give up on a student when they're 15 and they fail all math classes for their whole lives. He's never going to be a scientist. Just accept that and find something that will work. So you know, I say that uh, in vocational education, Research shows that it's moderately better for the students and vastly better for taxpayers. All right, now last, I want to go over the humanist critique. One of the most common criticisms of my book is, look, what you're saying is true, but it doesn't matter because the true point of education is not to train people for jobs at all. There are many critical reviews in my book by humanities professors where they say, Look, Kaplan is a typical caveman economist who thinks that the only possible reason to go to school is to get a job, but that's not the point of school at all. The point of school is to teach people to love culture, to, to expand their minds, to get them to explore the great questions, to read Plato and Machiavelli. All right, that's the real point. All right, so there are many critics who have said that Sir sort of Singley can explain the economic rewards of education, but they say I've ignored what we call the humanist case for education, enriching the personality. All right. The rhetorical question is, you know, doesn't education enhance students' appreciation of ideas and culture and teach them to be good citizens? And I, there have been many book reviews written saying Kaplan never considers this question. Right. I have to say that seems unfair to me. Look, I can understand reviewing a book that you have not read. Everybody does that, right? Everyone, you can't read, you have to read a book before you review it. But I think that before you review a book, you should read the table of contents. And if they did read the table of contents, they would see I have a whole chapter on this humanist critique. And here's what I say, I'm actually not a caveman economist. I'm a very cultured economist. I'm a very nerdy economist. I'm an economist who loves ideas and culture. I'm a huge fan, sincerely, of German opera. 
Und Richard Wagner ist, ist ausgezeichnet, ja? Ja, wonderful. Yes, and Smetana is good too, right? I mean, is that right? Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Smetana. Yes. Smetana. Yes. All right. Yes. Sorry, Wagner's better. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, I say, look, I share these ideals. You know, ideas are my life. Every day I go to lunch and I talk about ideas. I'm not someone who's only thinking about making money. Right? I would have done something very different with my, with my life if I was only thinking about making money. I would have been an economic consultant or something like that. Um, but what I say is that you should not give credit to, to education for good intentions. We, what we actually see when we look at real world education is that it is very bad at actually causing appreciation of ideas or culture. Right, so in my book, I go over many measures of this. Here's one simple example. In the United States, it is very common for teachers to try to make students love poetry. All right, do some lucky teachers try to make you love poetry? All right. They almost never succeed. How do we know? Because poetry books sell almost no copies. And almost no one ever buys a poetry book. Therefore, the effort, noble though it may be, to instill appreciation of poetry is a failure. And we, could, we should not give schools credit for making students appreciate poetry when after all of the effort of teachers, people still do not appreciate poetry. Uh, the way that I do it in my book is I say, look, let's be generous. Let's say that schools will get all credit for all consumption of high culture and ideas in America. Even then, it is so little. It really is a rounding error. It just is not something that schools are good at inspiring. All right, now what about citizenship? Does education turn students into good citizens? Well, uh, here what I say is that there is evidence in the United States that education modestly changes students' political views. It's only a modest change. It's not large. Right? And actually, the effect seems to change over time. There's a long period where it seems like the more time you spend in school, the more Republican you are. Now, that's uh, the opposite seems to be true. Although in both cases, the actual measured effects are much smaller than almost anyone would think. In the United States, we have a long debate about are schools doing horrible left-wing brainwashing or not? Right? And I say, well, in one sense they are, because if you just go and listen to what teachers say, there's a lot of left-wing brainwashing. On the other hand, are they successfully changing students into Maoists? It's like, no, because hardly any students become Maoists. Like, well, what about what I see on social media? Yeah, that's like 10 students who are very loud. Right? They do not speak for their generation. Not even close. Anyway, so education does modestly change students' political views, but again, when you look at the evidence, the mechanism seems much more to be about sorting rather than actual actual persuasion. Uh, so here's the idea. Uh, what, one of the main things that education does is it causes social isolation. People who go to college talk to other people who go to college. People who don't go to college talk to other people who don't go to college. It does seem like when you are in one group, this changes your view to be very similar to, to be more similar to that of the group that you are talking to. But this does not actually change the overall social view, right? Why? Because the when you take a student that was not going to college and move him to college, he now talks to college graduates, but he also no longer talks to people that did not go to college. The non-college people become more like each other. The college people become more like each other. The best way of thinking about this is in America, there's a college called Brigham Young University. It is the number one Mormon school in America. You guys know about Mormons? Yeah. They have not done polygamy for over 100 years. It's a total misconception. Uh, just a few radical groups. Uh, anyway, they, don't do, they haven't done polygamy for a very long time. But often that's the only thing Europeans know about Mormons is they're polygamists, so it's not even true. But anyway, uh, Brigham Young is 99% Mormon. If a non-Mormon goes there, do you think he's going to convert to Mormonism? It's pretty likely, because 99% of your other classmates believe this. You're around them all the time. That's a pretty big social effect. But what if we sent everyone in America to Brigham Young? What would that do? Yeah, well, probably it would no longer work, because most people at Brigham Young would no longer be Mormon. 
So that's what I'm saying is the actual main mechanism of what's going on in changing students' minds, which means that the net political effect of bringing students to school is unclear. I will say since I wrote my book, the level of left-wing brainwashing in American colleges has gone up a lot. Um, I don't know that this is actually working, but at least I'm wondering, now, there's a general rule which if you see that something doesn't work, one possibility is it will never work. Another is the dosage was too low. So you give someone a drug and it doesn't help. Maybe the drug is useless. Maybe you need to give them 1,000 milligrams instead of 100 milligrams. Right, so this is going on in American universities. It's a kind of experiment to see. Um, my experience is that while there are official brainwashing sessions for American students, but still, once students feel like you are not going to get mad at them, they still have many heterodox opinions and are fun to talk to. So I do talk to American students a lot. I very rarely meet brainwashed students, although it is probably not for, long, not for lack of trying. All right, so when we stop there and move to questions. Thank you very much.